So in this segment, we're going to be discussing the secret cross-party summit conf- uh, summit held to confront the failings of Brexit. So you take a couple of days off and, you know, big news comes out. Sad times. Uh, but we move. So um, we've got the extraordinary cross-party summit bringing together leading leavers and remainers, including Michael Gove and senior members of Keir Starmer's shadow cabinet has been held in secrecy to address the failings of Brexit, how to remedy them in the national interest. The Observer can reveal. And I do wonder, did these people know um, that news would get out? I think they did, because they had their kind of dodges prepared, Sunak and uh, and Gove. And we'll talk about that in another video, because I've got one more, two more lined up on this one, potentially. Gove being involved in this one as a major Brexiteer is crazy. Uh, I wonder what his endgame is here Um you know, especially with Sunak, because Sunak would have had to send him. You know, Sunak would have had to authorise this, despite Sunak denying any knowledge of it. Given that the Tories keep claiming that Labour would seek to rejoin the EU, uh, having secret me- meetings with them is weird. I think this summit is about how to um, how to form a less antagonistic relationship with the EU, um, i.e. we're the antagonists, you know, we're the ones causing problems over the protocol and um, other issues. So I think it's aimed at how can we have a more friendly relationship with the EU? Where's the consensus within, you know, the two major parties, which is weird. The two day uh, gathering of some of the country's most senior Tory and Labour politicians from both sides of Brexit debate, together with diplomats, defence experts and the heads of some of the biggest businesses and banks, was held at the historic Ditchley Park retreat in Oxfordshire on Thursday afternoon and evening and on Friday. So uh, what a two day event. Uh, diplomats would be there to potentially see what the mood is like within with the EU, with their EU counterparts, as these are the people who would help within any negotiations. So it makes sense. The UK are looking for closer links to the EU over security. The issue is twofold. The UK is no, uh, no longer has access to EU databases, which is a security concern, as it makes it harder for um, the EU and the UK to work together, work with each other over security issues, more so for the UK than the EU. The other thing is they could be looking at um, look at maybe a joint. Um, they could be looking at this maybe um, through joint security committees. Uh, maybe that's something they'd want to set up, given that NATO's response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine has been disjointed at best, you could argue, um, with different countries wrangling over what to send uh, to Ukraine without you know, fears of escalation with Russia. The UK has tried to pressure from the outside on issues like banning Russia from the CHAP system. The final thing could be um, over supply chain for security issues. Um, the Met Police could not source British car um, British cars for ministers um, because these cars are built to specific standards. We had to buy uh, German Audis instead um, instead of British Jags. Maybe they're looking at exceptions for UK defence um, f- defence industries in the supply chains, potentially, but that's speculation. Or maybe they're looking at um, any EU suppliers getting some sort of special access to the UK um, in order to help us keep um, you know, manufacturing uh, weapons of war, essentially, uh, and weapons of defence, I guess. Businesses would be there because of the supply chain problems, the paperwork, the checks, and of course the labour shortages. Banks would be there because they have been badly impacted by Brexit with a lot of money moving out of the City of London. Less trades are happening there in terms of um, derivatives derivatives and stocks. We have seen the end of passporting, which makes, quote, the the EU uh, passporting system for banks and financial service companies enables firms that are authorised in any EU or EEA uh, state to trade freely. In others, in any others with minimal authorization, that's from the UK Finance um, website. And so, basically, what that means is, you know, it allows people to do trades without any issues, um, regardless of which member state they're in. You know, that system has gone, um, so that that's quite uh, that's not great. On the 30th of June 2025, EU traders will lose access to UK-based CCPs, which means that it will be much harder for them to trade derivatives and equities, as CCPs ensure um, help to. Uh, ensure that happens so you know let's not get bogged down too much with all the crazy details but it makes sense for these people to be here um this should have happened really back in 2016 definitely in 2019 for the withdrawal agreement and later with the tca so for some reason now the tories are getting businesses and other groups together to actually discuss these issues um when they should have done so from the start really um but you know some of the financial stuff isn't super important unless you're a big nerd like fact not fiction big nerd and you can actually explain this stuff uh, properly and the real impacts of it but just kind of a broad overview given that marine mcginnis 
and um, a lot of uh, different kind of EU uh, people within the EU are really looking at what can they take away from the UK financial services industry specifically. Documents from the meeting obtained by the Observer describe it as a quote public uh, sorry private discussion and quote under the title quote how can we make Brexit work better with our neighbours in Europe end quote and once you open this can of worms it means Sunak knows that Brexit is not working and that we need closer ties with the EU. Um, the UK hinted at a Swiss style deal without freedom of movement and we know that's not going to happen but it's clear that Sunak's team um, knows we need much closer alignment with the EU. That's why you got Jeremy Hunt. You know, he was talking about a Swiss style deal without freedom of movement. So you're talking about goods, services, and uh, capital. But obviously, you would need dynamic alignment with the EU in order to make that work. That's what the Swiss have. So, um, you know, Hunt, a Remainer, former Remainer, but he's one of the, he is part of um, Sunak's cabinet. He's the chancellor. He's the second most powerful person, uh, politician in the country. Um, so it's clear Sunak's team um, has a lot of pro-Remain parts in it. He's not ostracised them like uh, Johnson did. Among the prominent Remainer politicians present, there were Foreign Secretary David Lammy, Shadow Defence Secretary John Healy, and the former European Commissioner and Labour Cabinet Minister Peter Mandelson, who acted as the chairman. So it's interesting, you've got a Labour lead acting as the chairperson for this meeting. From the Tory Remainer camp, the ex-Cabinet Minister and long-serving Minister for Europe, David Liddington, attended. So Gove is not the Foreign Secretary, so him talking to Lamy is a bit odd, given that they're not really the counterparts for each other. But given neither side has a Brexit Minister, it does make some sense. I think Gove is trying to gauge where Labour are in terms of Brexit policy. You have a lot of different people involved here. A lot of pro-Remainers uh, uh, and Brexiteers, specifically, uh, along with uh, businesses and other people. Non-political attendees included John Simmons, chair of the pharmaceutical company Glaxsmith Klein, Oliver Robbins, Goldman Sachs managing director and former Brexit negotiator from 2017 to 19. So he would have had a close relationship with Gove, I think, because Gove was in charge of the Department for Exiting Europe. Tom Scholar, the former Treasury Permanent Secretary, and Angus Lampsey, uh, NATO Assistant Je uh, Secretary General for Defence Policy. And so if we look at each one of here, GlaxoSmith, Klein, the pharmaceuticals, um, given the fact that AstraZeneca have set up shop within um, uh, within Ireland, it kind of makes sense that they, they would be concerned about pharmaceutical companies maybe moving more to the EU, Goldman Sachs, uh, banks. Um, so yeah, some of these people do make a lot of sense. A confidential introductory uh, statement for those at the meeting acknowledged there was now a view among, uh, quote, some at least that so far the UK has not found its way forward outside of the EU, end quote, with Brexit, quote, acting as a drag on our economy, uh, on our growth and inhibiting the UK's potential, end quote. And experts were telling us from the start Brexit, um, be, you know, before the start of Brexit, before we left the EU, um, it was causing damage to our economy due to the uncertainty. Of course, this is back in 2017, uh, 2016 even. No one, um, no one knew what was going to happen. Uh, May's Withdrawal Act was uh, temporary, um, which some people get confused about, but with the ability to have extensions. Um, Johnson lied about the impact of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, and we can see the impacts it's having now. There are uh, long-term consequences of the diplomatic damage we have done. Britain's word is worthless, with us under the last two PMs playing games over the protocol, Johnson and Truss. This conference is more just about England trying to figure out um, what England wants to do, or as Brussels would say, England negotiating with itself, which is a pretty funny line. Um, I will give them that. A source who was at the uh, who was there um, said it was a quite constructive meeting, end quote, that addressed the problems and opportunities of Brexit, but which dealt heavily on the economic downside to the UK economy at a time of global instability and rising energy prices. What are these opportunities, though? You know, Labour might have been a bit reserved, uh, just in case Gove would try and paint them as being too EU positive in the media if he leaked stuff. Um, they focus more on the downsides because that's all there really is. We can try and carve our own path, but at the end of the day, if you want a strong economy, you need strong exports. The UK lost its largest trading partner, a service-based economy that is struggling to get deals on services. The only Brexit I, I see, um, the only Brexit benefit I see is that the Tories have been exposed as the clowns that they are. Uh, quote, the main thrust of of it was that uh, of the meeting was that brexit is um britain is losing out that brexit is not delivering our economy is in a weak position said the source 
quote, it was about moving on from leave remain and what the issues we are we now have to face and how we can get into the best position in order to have a conversation with the EU about changes to the EU uh, to the UK EU trade and cooperation agreement when that happens. And it looks like they were looking for a consensus on things we could do outside of the EU. Um, I guess to I guess make Brexit work, um, but we are not a member of the EU or EFTA, which means single ma- the single market is effectively closed off to us for frictionless access. And yes, before anyone tries, the only way to get frictionless access to the single market exists via the uh, by a via being a member of the EU or EFTA if you are also then a member of the customs union, a full member of the customs union as well, which no EFTA member is. Um, a part of so yeah you need either full membership of the eu or single market uh, so essentially to be an after country with custom uh, to be in the customs union so it's very um weird kind of this whole conference is just bizarre i'll be i'll be honest um i think maybe one of the things that the tories are looking at is if they did try to pass maybe some brexit deregulation bills would labor back them on it that's it, it's a very bizarre um conference Gove, who co-led the Vote Leave campaign in 2016, is understood to have made regular contributions, including opening an informal conversation on Thursday night with a source saying that he was, quote, very honest, end quote, about the shortcomings of Brexit while still believing it proved the right decision in the long run. If it's going to be the right decision in the long run, why the conference, why the cloak and dagger? Seems he and other Brexiteers are running scared. I do wonder how honest Gove was, given his relationship with the truth is similar to Johnson's relationship with the truth, i.e. a complete mess. But it means in secret that he knows that Brexit is doing damage to the UK right now. When will he publicly admit it? In a book he has written, I imagine. Uh, in terms of ardent Tory Brexiteers, the summit documents said while on the European side there was, quote, little interest in further wrangling over Brexit and little time being devoted to the relationship with the UK ellipses, there is also clear European as well as British strategic interest in a productive and close relationship, end quote. And what this is, is this is the UK's view on what the EU have said. So the EU are not interested in further talks right now. Um, and the UK wants a more positive, a more strategic relationship with the EU and a closer relationship. That's from the UK side of things, that's the UK perspective. So this paragraph is pretty important in my opinion. You know, I hinted at it in a community post, which people say, why why the cliffhanger? This, this was the paragraph I missed somehow, um, despite the fact that this was one of the main reasons I wanted to cover this in a video. So the EU are not fussed about the UK or further talks. I think they only care about the protocol, which makes sense. Let me put it like this. Um, so, so the people of the audience and certain other rejoiners will understand why the EU, why the UK are not a priority for the EU. The EU are dealing with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, trying to figure out how they can do more damage to Russia whilst minimising the impacts to themselves, trying to help source alternative gas for its members to, uh, and avoid blackouts, which the EU is helping countries like Germany with, I believe. Competing with the US for the future of green manufacturing, taking as much as the EU can in terms of financial services from the UK without risking the financial stability of the member states. Look at U2008 crisis, setting up additional semiconductors within the EU to avoid future chip shortages and their policies towards China. Now, I probably missed some things, but it's clear that the UK, apart from the protocol, is not on the EU's radar. So when rejoiners keep saying we can rejoin the single market, just know we are not, we're not there. You know, the EU don't care about us and won't be for a while unless we cause more trouble. That's the only way, that's the only reason that you talk about us um, is when there are protocol issues. Um, the source stated that, quote, rejoining the EU will not be on the agenda, end quote. The summit papers nonetheless stressed that the EU and the UK, quote, have shared interests on containing Russian aggression, developing new sources of energy and building major technology companies with their capital base on our side of the Atlantic rather than just the US, end quote, as well as the common defence interests. So let's let's again we can break this one down piece by piece containing russian aggression both the eu and the uk have done this separately we tried to pressure the eu to block russian access to the chaps payment system which the eu did but i doubt that was down to uk pressure probably down to the commission uh, and eu member states figuring things out for themselves like how can they still buy russian gas at the time because russia was still supplying you know large amounts of gas to europe but there would have been pressure from the americans too and i'm sure that pressure would have been far more great than the uk's 
Both sides have sanctioned a sanction list, but the EU sanctions were far more effective and were implemented much quicker than the UK's. Why would the EU want the UK to have any major role in developing new technology companies or sources of energy? If these companies are based in the UK, they will have limited access to researchers being outside the Horizon programme, and now freedom of movement makes it harder for EU uh, member nationals to come to the UK and the same the other way around. So research would be very difficult if it's based in the UK. These companies do set up their base in the UK, say their HQ. Uh, the UK could let them make enormous profits and refuse to windfall tax them, something we saw with Shell, for example. Like the UK has a vested interest, uh, sorry, like the EU has a vested interest in stopping these companies from setting up in either of the US, uh, either the US or the UK, because the EU are competing with both sides. Defence might be the only area we can get an agreement, but given that some people in the UK were against an EU army, where is this cooperation even going to go? It might be on uh, defence agreements, maybe developing um, joint forces or whatever, or more coordination, but that's why NATO exists. That's the problem. And that's one of the reasons why the EU wants to set up its own kind of EU army, is because NATO is unreliable, but also the UK is fairly unreliable in a lot of regards. Um, the conference also raised questions about forging closer links with the EU on tackling organised crime, illegal immigration and defence, uh, and raised the possibility of a joint EU-UK policy towards China, asking, quote, what are the prospects for a fully coordinated policy on dealing with China, end quote. And again, these are all things the EU can do um, without us, for the most part. We're the ones that generally would cause issues in, the, in these areas. If there are issues like people smuggling, then it makes sense to work with each other, depending on circumstances. Why would we get a coordinated effort with Ch on China. The EU has set up deals with China, not full FTAs, but deals aimed to open up the Chinese market, which pulls them pulls the two closer together. The EU and the UK w would probably be against a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, but outside of that, is the alignment is there alignment for either side? Plus, if Russian money can flow so easily within the city of London, what's to stop Chinese money or Gulf state money? The UK is pretty unreliable in these areas. Not saying the EU is perfect, but why add another loose end when the EU has already uh, loose ends with Poland and Hungary? Do you guys see what I'm saying here? The highly unusual cross-party uh, cross nature of the gathering of Brexit opponents and the seniority of those who agreed to attend reflects a growing acceptance among politicians that these two main parties, as well as business leaders and civil servants, that Brexit in its current form is damaging the UK economy and is reducing its strategic influence in the world, and concern is growing at the top of the Labour Party that it poses a threat to the success of any future Labour government unless problems such as increased trade friction can be addressed. And I think... Brexit really caps the success of Labour when you think about it. No matter how much they try to revive manufacturing in the UK or agriculture, they will keep running into the issue of who will they sell the stuff to. Um, and with the trade barriers existing with the EU, it will keep hampering exports to the EU. Um, services will be the, the next one to feel the full impact. Some services are already struggling, especially smaller providers, but will only get worse. I hope Mr Bre Make Brexit Work knows that, looking at you, Starmer. In effect, calling for a cross-party consensus on Brexit, the summit papers referred to the need to move on from the current mix of antagonism and nostalgia to excitement about what the future could bring for the UK and for Europe, and also said that finding solutions was all the more urgent because of, quote, global unrest, supply chain fragility and inflation, end quote. And I think both sides want cross-party consensus, you know, Labour and the Tories. Um, so we don't fall into a cycle of one side winning and tearing up what the previous side did. I don't see the point of this conference, though. If the Tories wanted to do this, they should have done this from the start. Maybe they're looking at some way to blame Labour for the Brexit stuff or drive a wedge between the uh, like the FPP e pro EU crowd on um, Twitter mainly and the Labour Party. I don't know, but for the most part, the EU can do most of this stuff outside. Uh, without the UK, and you know the arguments of we need to kind of drop the antagonism and nostalgia is really England just negotiating with England because that was the whole point of Brexit. We were going to trade more with the Commonwealth uh, countries. You know, that's nostalgia. That's the past speaking. For those such as Gove who com campaigned to leave the EU, there's also a clear interest in ensuring Brexit is not viewed as a failure over the long term, even if this means conceding that there will be closer alignment with the EU. This will probably be about his legacy as this is, um, this is the thing he'll be known for most, um, you know, Brexit. But it is a failure as we head into you know the medium term, yeah, post Brexit. It's not improving at all. They can keep blaming global factors, but we are the weakest G7 member post COVID, and Brexiteers are struggling to answer why. Much of the focus of the meeting was on how a Labour or Tory government would use a scheduled review of the Brexit Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Uh, quote, to reduce some of the current frictions that have seriously damaged UK exports to the EU 
in particular. Labour, which has said it would not take the UK back into the EU, the single market or the customs union, has already committed to using the 2025 review of the TCA to try and reduce uh, barriers to trade. And Labour can't take us back into the single market unless they join EFTA or the EU proper. Why Labour don't just say this, I don't understand. Labour are pretty lost on Brexit too, so the Tories asking Labour for help doesn't make sense. But given given the fact that the thing's under review post general the next general election, uh, it's a bit weird to kind of focus on this issue for, for both parties right now. Um, it's just a weird, like I said, the summit it just makes sense. It doesn't make sense. According to the timetable of the meeting, the open sessioning was headed, quote, how might the trade and cooperation agreement be optimised now and amended later? How might trade and services between the UK and EU be managed or and Europe be managed um, be better managed, end quote. Sorry. Asking questions like this really feels like the Tories are looking to steal Labour's ideas. Unless we get dynamic alignment with the EU, trading goods will continue to be extremely difficult um, even then, but there are still checks and paperwork, you know, even if we get, you know, if we were a member of the single market, which, you know, I've already explained how that works. If we can get deals on services, it would help with exporting services, and there may be options there, but the EU are looking at taking away some of those services from the UK because in the immortal words of Kai, 